Okay, good morning. Let's get uh, started. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, two examples on Gauss's law, then I will switch to some conceptual questions that will go uh, take us through uh, the concepts that we have uh, seen in this first part of the course. Uh, Gauss's law is something very basic, uh, so I hope that it is clear, but I, do uh, I will go through uh, two examples just uh, to make sure that we understand the basics. So here we have uh, uh, an infinite cylinder, so the geometry is like this. Uh, in fact, uh, the cylinder extends along the z-axis, like this. And we're being told that there is a, a volume charge density, rho sub v, inside the cylinder. This is a cylinder of radius a. So we have a problem with cylindrical symmetry. Remember that Gauss's law is always true. However, it is only useful to calculate fields, like what the question is asking here, if you have spherical, cylindrical, or rectangular symmetry. So basically, uh, it holds all the time. But if you have a problem and you're asking yourself, should I apply Gauss's law here to find the electric field, then the answer should be yes if you have a problem that is specified with a symmetry, either cylindrical or spherical or uh, rectangular. Why is this cylindrically symmetric? First of all, the geometry is a cylinder. And second, the volume charge density depends only on the radial coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system. So if it depended on phi or z, then this symmetry would be breaking. And then I would need to apply, let's say, Coulomb's law to find the field. But now that I have a cylindrically symmetric charge distribution in a cylindrically symmetric geometry consisting of a cylinder, then Gauss's law is applicable, can help you find the electric field, and the surface is no surprise that the surface that you should use is also a cylinder. So that is uh, sort of common sense. So the solution then should be to apply Since the problem is cylindrically symmetric, we will go with Gauss's law, not Poisson, no Laplace, no Coulomb. And the other thing that you can say in this case is that because of the symmetry, I have posted a note to show this if you are not convinced. When you have this kind of a symmetry, you can immediately say that the electric flux density as well as the electric field, but I will go with the electric flux density because this is the general form of Gauss's law that holds both for dielectrics and for free space. And I recommend that you go with that because of its generality, uh, the one that applies to the electric flux density. So you can immediately say that the electric flux density has this form. So when we have this symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, we can immediately assume the electric flux density has this form. And then Gauss's law would say this, Q enclosed. No epsilon not here, on a closed surface. And that closed surface here will be cylinder. So because I have two cases, uh, I have two areas, two regions. One region where there is the charge density and a region outside the charge density. I will apply Gauss's law two times. One for a cylinder that is inside the charge density, one for a cylinder that is outside the charge density. Uh, so that you see it a little bit better, let me just uh, flip the cylinder like this. This is a z-axis. And uh, the charge density is basically in here. Uh, radius uh, of this is a. So I will take two cases. One case where I apply Gauss's law in a cylinder of radius r. less than a. 
And I will do and uh, length, let's say, L. And another case where I will apply Gauss's law on a cylinder of radius r greater than a. So this will be the second case. Radius r greater than a, again, length l. Doesn't really matter if it is the same or a different one. So this will be case one. This will be case two. In both cases, the left-hand side will, of Gauss's law as you see over there, will be, I'm putting in the uh, form for the electric flux density. This is the one. And then I, uh, obviously, Gauss's law applies on closed surfaces. So this is a closed cylinder. And therefore, in principle, I should consider flux through all three surfaces, the surrounding cylindrical surface, the top and the bottom. But you see right away that the uh, electric flux density is radial. So there is actually no flux through the top and the bottom. There is no flux through the top and the bottom. I can actually do this. Uh, I can uh, do this in greater detail, ds. So I can break this. So we have a closed cylindrical surface. So I can say that this can be broken down to to the cylinder around it. That is everything except the top and the bottom. That is the first part. And I do this only for tutorial purposes. Uh, you can just say that I ignore right away the flux through the top and the bottom, that it is obvious. But just in case you are not convinced by now, I will do that in uh, those steps. dr of r, r hat. In this case, if I am on a cylinder, the surface element you want to use is r hat r d phi dz. Okay. So that is the one that you use for this surface. Why? Because if you go to your age sheet, you will find three surface elements. One will be r d phi dz, the other will be dr dz, the other will be uh, dr r d phi. But if you are on a cylinder, your r is fixed. Therefore, dr is zero. Therefore, none of the other two surface elements is your surface element here. You are on a cylinder. R is fixed. Dr is zero. So therefore, the other two should not be there. So I, we have this. And then we have the one for the top. So on the top face, the Ds will be pointing in the z direction. So you see that the dot product will include a, an r dot z that gives you 0. Again, I'm doing this for tutorial purposes. You can just say it by inspection. There won't be any flux through the top. And there won't be any flux through the bottom either. So the bottom is uh, basically uh, the surface like this. OK, so again, this is 0. So this is typical for Gauss's law that you have an expression that is very easy to integrate. R dot R is 1. You see, you integrate with respect to d phi dz. Therefore, dr is a constant on the cylinder. R is a constant. They can come out. And that is true for both cases. So let me uh, continue here. So we have R dr. 
and then an integral with respect to d phi that will go from 0 to 2 pi, and with respect to dz that will go from, let's say, some z1 to z1 plus l. It doesn't really matter. So z1, let's say that this cylinder starts from z1 to z1 plus l. So for both cases, this will give you l. This will give you 2 pi. And therefore, the left-hand side in both cases will be 2 pi r l dr in both cases. And that makes sense because you have a, on the cylinder, the electric flux is constant, depends only on r. And therefore, this integral, you didn't even have to do it. It is that constant times the area of the cylinder, which is 2 pi r l. Okay, so... Um, Again, I do this for tutorial purposes. And now I have to break down the two cases when the enclosed charge, when, when I am inside or outside the cylinder, because in the first case, I'm enclosing part of the charge. There is charge outside here. In this case, I'm enclosing all the charge that I could enclose within this length L. So therefore, those two cases have to be separated. So in case one, the enclosed charge, uh, you see we're given a volume charge density. So we have to integrate it over the volume, the volume element dV in cylindrical coordinates, again, uh, per your age sheet, is uh, R d phi dz dr. So now uh, R will go from 0 to, let me call this uh, R prime, just so that we don't uh, confuse it with the uh, radius R. R prime divided is at the R prime. So I just put it as prime so that I don't confuse it with the radius R of the cylinder, where I apply the, the law. Uh, so you see I have uh, this rho naught as a constant. Uh, a squared outside as a constant. And uh, let me just push, uh, or my, uh, let me push the boards up so that we don't have an obstructed view. And when I finish this, I will push it also up. So constant, constant. Uh, d phi will be integrated from 0 to 2 pi. dz will be integrated from z1 to z1 plus l. Again, the integral with respect to dz will give me the length of the cylinder. Uh, this is a dummy variable because it will cancel out with this length on the left-hand side. So anyway, I don't care that much about this variable. What is important here is this integral with respect to r prime, which is r prime to the power of 3. And that will go from 0 to a, uh, sorry, to r. And then I have 0 to 2 pi of d phi prime. And that uh, integral of uh, dz that will give uh, d phi, sorry. And then uh, the integral of dz that will give me the length of the cylinder, that is L. So all in all, in this case, or let me stop here and ask if there are any questions up to this point. So now I have uh, this integral over there, uh, constant rho naught alpha squared. Then uh, this integral with respect to R will give me r to the power of 4 over 4, and then I have 2 pi L. So this is the enclosed charge in the first case. In the second case, the enclosed charge changes in the sense that now I'm going not up to r, but all the way up to a, which is the radius of this cylindrical charged area, and I can obtain the enclosed Q 
I can obtain the enclosed cube by just taking this formula and putting r equal to a. So you see this gives me the enclosed charge for any cylinder up to radius r. So now I can just go there, take this formula, put r equals to a. That will give me the total enclosed charge. You see the big cylinder is big, but it encloses charge only up to a. So enclosed charge exists only up to here in this uh, cylinder. So up to a. So of course I can redo the calculation, but it's much easier to keep my eyes open and simply say that, OK, in that second case, I can reuse this formula, put r equal to a, and find the enclosed charge. That will be rho naught by a uh, squared a to the fourth 4 to pi l. So in, the, uh, in this case, it will be rho naught a squared by 4 times 2 pi l. I keep this 2 pi l separately. So now I can go ahead and apply Gauss's law. I have uh, both the left and the right hand side. So in case one, dr by times 2 pi r l will be uh, rho naught uh, by a squared, 4 a squared, r to the power of 4 times 2 pi l. You see I keep 2 pi l separate because it will cancel out with this. And I have that uh, the uh, electric charge density varies um, cubically within the uh, surface, within the, uh, uh, sorry, within the cylinder. So R naught, R to the power of cube of 3, 4 A squared. And then the electric field will be, the electric field will be, you see it's being given that uh, the electric, the, the dielectric permittivity is epsilon naught everywhere. So ER will be rho naught r cubed by 4 a squared epsilon naught. So this is my answer for r less than a. So case two, the enclosed charge is actually not changing with respect to the distance. So in this case now, dr times 2 pi rl is equal to rho naught a squared by 4 times 2 pi l. So the 2 pi l's cancel out again. And I have that dr will be uh, rho naught a squared by 4r. So as you would expect, that decays as 1 over distance from this uh, z-axis. From very far away, this density will not look any different than the line charge density that we started with in the first example we did in class. So in, uh, when you have a line charge density with rho sub L, uh, on the z-axis, uh, the electric field is rho L by 2 pi epsilon r, the case is 1 over r. So you would expect the same dependence here in um, this problem. Away from the axis, uh, this uh, should look like a line charge density and uh, the field should decay as 1 over r. And the electric field is uh, uh, rho naught a uh, squared by 4 epsilon naught r. So in this, uh, at this point, the problem has been, uh, has been solved. And uh, one thing to note is that at r equals a, the field is continuous. So if you put r equals a, uh, you will find the same answer from here and here. OK, any questions on this? Example. All right, so this is uh, my first example on Gauss's law. Let me just uh, do another one that uh, 
before I go to some conceptual questions, that couples Gauss's law with uh, our calculation of capacitors and capacitances. Uh, so this is uh, a little bit easier in terms of uh, Gauss's law. So we have a charged sphere of radius A. with a constant surface charge density, rho sub s. Okay, so now we have uh, a sphere pretty much like the sphere of the Van der Graaff uh, generator. Uh, the radius here is A, and there is only surface charge rho sub s here. So I can uh, find a few things uh, with this uh, sphere, just to remind you of uh, some uh, calculations that we did, uh, that we did uh, throughout the lectures, including Voltage, potential of the sphere with respect to infinity, capacitance of the sphere, energy stored in this system. So let's see a few things about this system that otherwise is very simple. So with the spherical symmetry, again we have a problem that can be solved with Gauss's law. We have a sphere, a sphere that is uniformly charged. So there is nothing uh, in this case that breaks the symmetry of the problem. It's a spherically symmetric problem, and hence I can immediately say that the electric flux density can be assumed to be of this form. So then I can apply Gauss's law on a sphere. And if I do, in fact, uh, the sphere is an easier surface to apply Gauss's law than a cylinder. The cylinder has the top and the bottom where I had to basically think that the flux is zero. The sphere is a uniform uh, surface. So the left-hand side of Gauss's law on a sphere of radius r will be dr the uh, surface element on the sphere is r squared sine theta d theta d phi. r dot r will give me 1. And then I have an integration with respect to theta and phi uh, from 0 to pi, theta and phi from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, dr and r squared are constants. In fact, I can take them out of the integral. Let me just uh, put them somewhere here. So I'm integrating. This is typical of Gauss's law, or what you want to see in Gauss's law. In Gauss's law, the integral has to be trivial. If uh, it is uh, getting difficult, then you are not in a situation where you should use Gauss's law. So in this case, I'm integrating on a sphere. The Electric flux density is constant on that sphere, so it comes out of the integral. And then I have the sine theta d theta, and then the d phi. So that will give me sine theta d theta, that will be 2. 0 to 2 pi d phi will be 2 pi. And I have the 4 pi r squared, the area of the uh, cylinder of the, sorry, of the sphere times the electric flux. So that is what I was expecting. So in case one, if I am inside this uh, charged sphere and I apply Gauss's law on a sphere like this, what do I get? The enclosed charge is zero. 
All the charge there is on the surface. Enclosed charge is zero. And therefore, dr is also zero. And the electric field is also zero. So inside this charged surface, I don't have any electric field. So the, surface, the, the sphere acts as a shield. There is charge outside. It's just like the hydro boxes, where you have a metallic box that can be charged from the environment, can be charged from, uh, let's say, lightning or power lines. But inside, you don't have any enclosed charge. So inside, uh, you don't have any field either. So you see the, the shell acts as a shield for the inside, and that's something you can show through Gauss's law. In the second case, you basically enclose the entire charge of the sphere. The sphere is uniformly charged with rho sub s. I don't need to run any integral. The enclosed charge there is this constant surface charge density times the surface of the sphere for pi a squared. So in that case, Gauss's law says for pi r squared dr is equal to rho s for pi a squared. So the four pi's cancel out. And we have a dr that is rho s a squared over r squared. And the electric field is rho s a squared by epsilon naught r squared. So let's say that we are in free space, no dielectric. So now here, is, uh, here are some uh, follow-up questions. What is the voltage of this sphere? with uh, reference to infinity. I can do that. I can take the reference to infinity. Anybody remembers why I can take my reference for electric potential to infinity? Because it's a finite charge distribution. Whenever you have a finite charge distribution, here it is just a sphere. It's like uh, the sphere of the Van der Graaff generator we saw. It's a finite distribution, therefore I can go and take reference for my potential to infinity. So V at uh, R equals A minus V at R going to infinity, which I set as my reference point, is minus, by our definition, infinity to A E dot DL. And immediately I uh, switch the sign and the bounds, and I will do this from A to infinity, E dot DL. This integral is path independent, so therefore I can choose the way to go to infinity. Yes? Sir, I have a question. So when you have DL, is that basically R hat DR? So DL um, can be anything that you choose. Since we are in the um, spherical coordinate system, you will go to H sheet, you find that there are three DLs. Okay? So in this case though, the electric field points in the radial direction. So my geometry looks like this. This is uh, the sphere. And infinity is somewhere here. The electric field goes like this. Okay? So obviously, I can uh, take a weird path to infinity, but the easiest path that I can choose is actually along an electric field line. So the DL that I will choose is dr r hat. Yes? Which direction? No, this is actually the definition V at the um, stop point minus V at the uh, start point. So this is the potential of the sphere with respect to infinity. So, and then uh, if you follow the definition we've, we've given, 
stop minus start is minus start to stop. So <laughs> it is, uh, you see, V2 minus V1 is minus 1 to 2 E dot DL. Why? Because if you remember fundamentally, voltage is work done per unit charge against the electric field. So you start from here, you go there. So you go from 1 to 2, and then you are doing work per unit charge against the force that the electric field will exert on the charge. Yes? So DL is defined to be the same direction as... No, DL can be anything because this path integral is anything. Okay, so I can choose to go to infinity like this. Okay, but it just doesn't make sense. So I choose the one that is convenient for me. And in most cases, in, in all cases, or most cases, the path that you choose that is convenient is along the electric field lines. If you know where the electric field lines are, if you don't know, it's a different story. But if you know, like we know here, you go along the electric field lines. So then I have uh, here from A to infinity, let me just check the time, uh, rho S A squared by epsilon naught R squared, R hat dot R dr. So R hat dot R hat is one, and I have a bunch of constants here, epsilon naught, and then a to infinity dr over r squared. The integral of this is minus 1 over r. So that will give you at infinity, this is 0. At alpha is... Uh, sorry, I shouldn't... So at uh, infinity is 0, at alpha is uh, 1 over alpha, okay? So 1 over infinity is 0, minus minus 1 over alpha, so finally the voltage here, the potential with respect to infinity, is uh, rho s alpha squared and alpha cancel out, rho s alpha by epsilon naught. Okay, so this is the uh, voltage. By the way, the sphere is an equipotential surface because the electric field is normal to that sphere. So the uh, electric field is in the radial direction. That means that spheres in this system are equipotential surfaces. So this is the potential. Having the potential, I can define the capacitance of this sphere. So this sphere has a capacitance, a self-capacitance with respect to infinity. And that self-capacitance, so you can imagine that this capacitor is formed with the sphere as the one conductor and infinity as the second conductor. That capacitance can be defined. It's the self-capacitance of the sphere with respect to its environment. Uh, so this is a Q over V. The Q of the sphere, we calculated it before. It should be somewhere here. It's rho s 4 pi a squared. The voltage is rho s a over epsilon naught. Rho s cancels out, and it is 4 pi epsilon naught a. So that is the capacitance of the sphere. Another thing we can ask about the system, so we saw uh, the fields, we saw the potential, we saw the capacitance. We can ask the energy that is stored here in the electric field. So if we wanted to do another question and ask what is the energy stored in the electric field, 
then we need to integrate over the area where the electric field is supported the volume energy density dv here is r squared sine theta uh, d theta d phi dr so this is uh, dv so this is the electrostatic energy density lowercase we now that we have the electric field we can actually do this calculation and uh, since I'm, I want to go to the conceptual questions, you can confirm that, in fact, this uh, turns out to be 1 half C times V squared, where V is the uh, voltage that we uh, found before. So I can just write down the uh, result, and uh, it is uh, a volume integral to be done. Uh, so V squared, rho S squared, A squared by epsilon naught squared. So this is the result. So it turns out that this formula that we saw for more conventional capacitors is actually holding here as well. Yes, please. So the energy density is this one. We found the electric field. The energy density uh, here is one half uh, epsilon times the electric field squared, which is uh, rho s squared a to the power of four by epsilon naught squared r to the power of four for r outside and zero inside because you don't have any field. That is the energy density. So basically, you have uh, this integral to do. R4 with R squared will give you an 1 over R squared. The calculation will be pretty much similar to this one because this same integral will also pop up over there as well. Yes, please. Um, so is the energy always equal to half of C squared? Um, I won't say always because you may have a different system that doesn't have any capacitance there or that you cannot define the capacitance. But if you have a system that has capacitance like this one, that is true. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you're calculating the energy, where, where is the, where are the bounds of R? The bounds of R will be, uh, so you see, in s generally the bounds of R will go from zero to infinity. But within uh, the sphere, you don't have any field. So the electric field there will be zero. So practically, the bounds of R are from A to infinity. And then uh, theta from 0 to pi, phi from 0 to pi. So you integrate everywhere where field is supported. So in general, there's going to be some zero to infinity. That's right. Everywhere where there is field, there is uh, electrostatic energy density. And in principle, we mentioned that in an example. Uh, I don't uh, know if that registered or not. But in principle, one could even calculate capacitance through the energy. So you can find capacitance, say, sorry, energy. Say energy is one half CV squared, and from that find C. So this is uh, the third, I call this the third uh, method to calculate capacitances. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I think he was first. Yes, go ahead. Well, I'm saying that you can confirm that this is the result. Yeah, so you can uh, confirm it, yes. There are questions that say, do this, right? That's what I'm saying. So I don't want to mislead you. If a question tells you, do this, do the integration, then you can do the integration. Yeah. Yes, please. Sorry, say that again, what did I say? Yeah, I don't remember you said that a capacitor is defined as two conductor with dielectric. Yes, so the second conductor here is infinity. Oh. That's, we call, that's what we call self-conductance. And again, this is a, uh, an important principle. It's not like a weird theory of some weird physicists, because when you um, use a touchpad, let's say, 
the way that the touchpad perceives you, perceives your touch, depends on your self-capacitance with respect to the environment. So that's why if you try holding, uh, let's say, uh, metal and uh, touching the, uh, the, the touchpad, you will see a touchpad won't respond. Uh, so it is uh, uh, an important concept. So when you have a conductor, a single conductor, you can still define its self-capacitance with respect to its environment. Okay, so I have some uh, conceptual questions. I don't know how much time, maybe 10 minutes. Uh, so I will do those from... the projector. Okay. All right. Uh, so there will be some conceptual questions in uh, your exam. By the way, I have announced, I have office hours now after the class and uh, I was asked for additional office hours, so I've cleared my, prog my schedule, so also I'm available uh, 2.30 to 5. So 2.30 to 5. I don't advise that you go all the way to 5, but I will be there. Um, so here is a charge distribution. It consists of two rings, rho L and minus rho L. So the, this has positive charge, this has negative charge. We go in the midpoint and we're asked to find the direction of the electric field. So there are some options here, x minus x, z minus z, or even zero, if it is zero. So any ideas? Yes. Minus z? Will be minus z because we know that, let's say we have solved this problem with a charged ring, and we have basically done this uh, calculation where if you have a point charge here on the ring, that will create an electric field this way. And for every such charge, there is a symmetric one that creates an electric field this way. So you add the two, you see that they have, uh, they create the component in the z direction. So what if you are below this? If you are below this, then all you need to think is that positive charges are sources of electric field lines. Negative charges are sinks of electric field lines. So at this point, due to the first charge distribution, the electric field will be pointing this way, away from the, away from the positive charges of the upper ring. And due to the second charge distribution, the electric field, which is negative, the electric field will also be pointing downwards because it will be pointing towards the negative charges. So, Electric fields sink into negative charges and they uh, come out of positive charges. So therefore, this one that is due to this will go downwards, pointing away from that charge distribution. And this also will be going downwards because it will be sinking towards the negative charges. So the, the, this is sort of like a capacitor. Uh, instead of uh, rectangular plates, it has uh, this um, distribution. So it's same thing though. Let me go to this one, actually. This is uh, relevant. So consider the equipotential surfaces. Uh, so we have uh, a bunch of equipotential surfaces. What is the work that is needed to move a point charge Q from A to B? So these are equipotentials. And we're being asked to find the work that is needed to move a point charge Q one coulomb from A to B. One coulomb is, is a huge amount of charge, by the way. Yeah, go ahead. May to B. Negative two. So again, the, the voltage, Vb minus Va, is work that you need to do to move the charge from A to B divided by Q. And um, therefore, the work that you need to move the charge from A to B is Q times Vb minus Va. So you are 
absolutely correct, 1 Coulomb times minus 1 minus 1. So it's minus 2 joules. So this is volt. Coulomb times volt will give you energy. The physicists have this unit of energy called electron volt that, uh, that is there to remind you that fundamentally voltage is work done per unit charge. Okay, let's uh, see. This one. A capacitor has charge plus minus Q on its plates, which are at a distance D. Alice moves the lower plate of the capacitor in order to double the distance between the plates, as shown in the figure. Did Alice have to do any work to move the plate? So move the plate. Yes. Well, uh, I am changing the voltage, but uh, I would prefer to look at the figure that says that the charge remains the same. So the energy stored in a capacitor is one half CV squared, but you can also express this in terms of the charge because uh, this can be uh, written as one half C Q squared over C squared. So one half Q squared over C. So Q has remained the same. The question is, how has C changed? So C is epsilon A over the distance between the plates. So C1 was this. C2 was this. Is this. So it's C1 over 2. So the energy in the second state is 1 half Q squared C1 over 2. Okay. So it is twice the energy you started from because charges have remained the same. So therefore, as a result, the energy has increased, has actually doubled. So this is the energy you started from. Uh, A is the area of the capacitors. So therefore, this has to come from uh, the work that has been done. OK, let's go here. The resistance of a cylindrical wire of conductivity sigma length L and cross-section S. So this is S, this is L, this is uh, sigma. The resistance increases as the cross-section increases, increases as the length increases, increases as the conductivity increases, increases as the conductivity decreases. So this is a high school question, I think, because the uh, resistance is L over sigma S. I think this is an old formula. We revisited it here, but length divided by conductivity times cross-section. It cannot increase as the cross-section increases. Resistance means resistance to the motion of charges. If you have bigger cross-section, in fact, there is more space for the charges to move. So this cannot be the answer. Increases as the length increases. Well, that is true because the more the length, the more the resistance that is uh, Whatever resistance you have per unit length, if you add more length, you get more resistance. So that definitely should be true. Increases as the conductivity increases. Can that be true? No, because conductivity is how well this material conducts current. So this cannot be the answer. Increases as the conductivity decreases. Well, yes, and you see it from here. If this decreases, then the overall resistance increases. Okay, we have a perfect conductor with a triangular shape. The direction of the electric field on each face is shown. Are these correct? Are, are all correct? A, e, A, E, B, E, C. So this is a perfect electric conductor. Or are some correct and some incorrect? Yes, go ahead.
That's exactly right. So the perfect conductor is an equipotential surface, and the electric field is normal to an equipotential surface. The other way to see it, as we mentioned, is that this tangential component here would have to be continuous across the conductor and hence zero. So it cannot exist. So the only component that can exist on the conductor, outside the conductor, is actually perpendicular. So thanks for your attention. Good luck and uh, for, for uh, your midterm. And um, enjoy the break after the midterm. <laughs>